afternoon uh, to everyone uh, who are here. So it is a pleasure uh, for me to be meeting all of you uh, in this session today. Uh, and I would like to welcome, it is a pleasure and honor for me to uh, meet all of you. And uh, this session, uh, we'll be discussing on managing grief, what to do when you encounter tragic events. This is part of our monthly neurosemantic series. We also have series on relationship or leadership, meta coaching, and also parenting. I would like to welcome all of you for uh, to this session. Thank you for being here. And I'm so excited that some of you are here for the first time. And also I welcome those who are here for the, uh, well, the, the second, third, fourth time, whatever it is uh, uh, for you. So welcome to, uh, to this session. Uh, I'd like to uh, say welcome to Mochi DC from South Africa, uh, Pierre uh, from uh, currently in uh, South Korea, uh, Perth Pal, uh, you are uh, somewhere in KL or, uh, or Petaling Jaya, you are in Malaysia, right? And Nitikun, uh, where are you from? I'm from KL. You're also I'm from KL. KL. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and Adeline, thank you for being here. And where are you from, Adeline? Uh, I'm originally from Penang, but oh. you were saying about Czechoslovakia because I am living in Czech. <laughs> Oh, okay. Thank you for being here. And also, Eva, it's been a very long time. <laughs> that, Just good uh, to see you again. Communicated. So are you uh, uh, there uh, alone or? Hold on now. Yeah, now I get to see you. <laughs> it's been quite a long time. Yes. Thank you for joining us. And also welcome, Christian. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. <laughs> and Thanks, Mazuki. Hello, everyone. <laughs> hey, Pierre. Uh, there's Pierre uh, for you. Thank you for uh, letting Pierre know about this uh, session, uh, Christian. Mm -hmm. And also, Hannah, uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening. And for those of you who are meeting me for the first time, I'm Mazuki. I'm a neurosemantics trainer and meta coach, and I also represent Malaysia in the international leadership team of the International Society of Neurosemantics. I work in the area of systematically developing skills in leading, communicating, and coaching to bring out the best in uh, individuals and also in organizations. In the 60 to 90 minutes together, we'll be discussing on two main themes. The first theme is the theme on the neurosemantics of managing grief. And the second theme is on what to do during tragic events. There are a few things that we'll be covering there. And as usual, especially for those of you who've been here before, you know that I will be uh, pausing for discussion after each main point. And I do that in order to invite any questions or comments. And especially for those of you who like to think out loud, I'd like to hear your thoughts. So that's why I uh, prefer to pause in order that I can have feedback from you to know what you're thinking. Now, um, warning uh, to those of you who are meeting me for the first time, my style is to be light and humorous. So if I laugh or smile, I'm not laughing at you, but at our silly human qualities. My purpose is to brighten things up, reduce being serious, and to be more real. As an introduction to this uh, session for this evening, tragic events such as loss or death happen. Our lives are a collection of events. We experience events that range from delightful to the mundane or tragic. Tragic events cause sadness and may lead to grief that causes sorrow or pain, which afflicts us and distresses us. So the question that I ask uh, in inviting you uh, this evening is, 
are you equipped to manage tragic events in ways that bring good to you and to the people around you? Even though the event may be tragic, are you equipped enough that you respond in ways that you can bring good to yourself and to the people around you? So that's basically the theme that we'll be discussing this evening. Now, with respect to the neurosemantic series, I had a list of topics to discuss, and those lists of topics uh, came from uh, Michael's book on neurosemantics. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, when I say Michael, I'm referring to the co-founder of neurosemantics, Dr. Michael Hall. Now, I decided to pause on the topic for um, on the topic for this week and bring this topic to you, because 11 days ago, my cousin suffered a stroke and was hospitalized on full life support. Three days ago, he passed away without regaining consciousness. He was 51 years old and the eldest of four siblings. He is survived by an ailing 78-year-old father, that's my uncle, three younger siblings, my cousins, a wife and an eight-year-old daughter. So this tragic experience was what prompted me to invite you to this discussion today. And the intention is that we are aware and have the necessary resources to experience such events healthily. So that's the intention behind our discussion for today. Okay, so I'm going to uh, share my screen right now as we go into the first theme, as we go into the first theme for our discussion for today. And that theme is the theme of the neurosemantics of grief. The first one is, what is emotion? Now, those of you who are familiar with the uh, neurosemantics model, and uh, you are aware that emotion in neurosemantics, we call it, is just the feel of meaning. We humans, we look at the world out there, and we have these two inner powers. Our powers of thinking and feeling, and with our powers of thinking and feeling, we create meaning. So emotion is the feel, when we create those meaning, we feel that meaning in our body. So that's at the core of emotion, how we create emotion. Now, the thing is, you are the meaning maker. We make meanings. Now, we make meanings either unconsciously or consciously. Unconsciously through our meta programs. These are our default way of operating our mind. So we, we automatically create meanings. And typically, these are meanings that relate to what's out there. So that's the what we call the primary level meaning. So typically, primary level meanings are almost unconscious from, uh, for most of us because we have programmed our mind to operate in a certain way. We call them the meta program. So those come in unconscious. Then the consciously created meaning, this comes from our self-reflexivity. Now, for many people, that self-reflexivity part is also unconscious because they are not aware that their minds are reflexing. So uh, a good portion of what neurosemantics is all about is to take charge of that self-reflexive process so your meaning-making becomes conscious. So since emotion is the feel of meaning, and since you are the meaning maker, therefore, you are the one who creates your meanings. You are your own emotion creator. You create your emotions. 
So you are the one in full control. Now, another thing that we say in neurosemantics is that all emotions are equal. When we say equal, we are referring to that there are no such thing as good or bad emotions. Now, there are emotions that cause us to feel comfortable. There are emotions that cause us to feel uncomfortable. Neither is good or bad. I sometimes use the word positive or negative. However, positive and negative when I refer to emotions doesn't mean positive is good and negative is bad. I'm referring it from the mathematical uh, 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 definition of positive. Math mathematics, positive means you are moving in the direction that you want to go. So that's a positive movement. When you move away from uh, where you want to go, that's a negative movement. So when I use the term positive emotion and negative emotion, I'm referring to emotions that bring you towards your goal as positive emotions and emotions that hinder you from going towards your goal, that pulls you away from your goal. So those are what I consider as negative emotions. Neither of them are good or bad because emotions are just the feedback mechanism to inform the difference between our experience of reality and our expectation of reality. Okay, so if I were to put it down over here, so here comes the mandatory green man over here. And he experienced reality out here. Now, prior to experiencing that reality, I was mentioning to Pierre just now that my uh, daughter is currently in Seoul, visiting Korea for a few days. So even before she goes to Seoul, she would have created a certain expectation of what Seoul is. So now that she's in uh, Seoul, Korea, then she will experience, she will experience how uh, uh, Korea is. So what we say is that this gap, so being mathematical here, I'll just draw a <laughs> delta there to indicate the difference. So that gap is what creates the experience. So if my expectation of reality is on the level of eight. That's my expectation. And then when I get there, I experience, oh no, it's not eight, it's only five. So when reality is lower than my expectation, my emotions go, oh, it's not so nice. So many people call that as negative emotion, but it's just a feedback mechanism. However, if it is the other way around, my expectation is that it's just going to be five. And I experience to be at eight. So my emotion goes up. Ooh, this is really nice. I love this. So that's basically what, what, what when we say that emotions are the feedback mechanism, to inform of the difference between the experience of reality with our expectation. So that's why we say that all emotions are equal because it's just giving us feedback about how accurate our expectation of reality with reality itself. Okay? Now, sadness. Sadness we experience that when our feel of the meaning of the event is less than what we anticipate. In the context of, let's say, uh, in the context of uh, we have somebody who is ill in hospital and we have the expectation that, oh, this person is not going to recover. Yeah and the person recovers, we feel happy. However, if the person, we have the expectation and hope that this person recovers and this person doesn't recover, 
then we feel sad. So that is why when, whenever death occurs, a loss, we feel that sadness because we uh, anticipate that we will not be able to be meeting this person again. So that sadness comes in. Now, one thing that we want to accept here, right up front, that sadness is a natural human function. It's natural. So just as it is natural for us to feel happy, to feel angry, to feel guilty, to feel fearful, those are natural human functions. So sadness is a natural human function. Grief, on the other hand, is avoidable and unnecessary. Why do I say that? Because grief creates sorrow or pain. It afflicts us. It distresses us. And grief occurs when we experience sadness and then we let our self-reflexive process, our thinking-feeling process, to go in ways that create energies that hurt us. Now, why I say that it is avoidable? Because when you are not skilled in using your powers, when I say powers here, I'm referring to, you, to your two internal powers, the powers of thinking and the powers of feeling. When you are not skilled in using those two powers, you may land in grief. So it is not about grief just comes to you. It is about not being able to use the powers in the right way. And because of that, you experience that sorrow or pain. Now, probably the, uh, an example, an analogy that I can use is like driving a car. I wonder how many of you uh, drive cars uh, because nowadays a lot of people don't drive cars anymore. They, like, they prefer to travel using public transport. But in Malaysia, uh, a lot of us still have to rely on cars rather than public transport. Now, uh, YouTube is a treasure trove of funny things and silly things that human beings do. Have you ever seen on YouTube videos of people going to park in front of a store and suddenly the car accelerates and hits the, <laughs> the storefront? Yeah. So mistaking the accelerator pedal to the brake pedal. So instead of braking and the, start, the car stops, the person presses the accelerator pedal and the car just crashes into the, uh, into the store. Okay? So misuse of power, misuse of uh, what is available. Same thing as, uh, and this has happened to me uh, a few times. I wonder if it has happened to you mistaking the reverse gear for the for the forward gear. How many of you have ever done that? <laughs> there are quite a number of times that I thought that I was already in uh, forward gear in drive and I pressed the accelerator pedal and the car went backwards. Luckily, I'm skilled in uh, left foot braking so I can brake very quickly. <laughs> so... When we do not use our faculties in the right way, in the context of sadness, sadness is a natural human function. However, grief is avoidable because grief is caused by running our brain in ways that hurt and harm ourselves. And we are the one who is causing that grief in ourselves. That's why I say grief is avoidable and unnecessary okay now the next point that i would like to bring you now let me just pause there for a moment because uh, in case anyone uh, has any thoughts or question uh, right now so let me just pause yeah oops yes let me just pause here and uh, let me invite any questions or comments from any one of you. Mazuki. Yes. Okay. So I just want to check with you first because I have a question that I think you might answer later. 
But when you said, so you have the expectation of someone's going to get well, but then they don't get well. And then there's sadness. And then you uh, reflex, yeah, reflex, uh, reflexive, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Reflexivity. uh, Reflexivity. Then you start reflexivity. And then in that reflexivity, you start metastating it. And so Mm. I'm presuming you start doing the the three Ps, the personal, permanent, uh, pervasive. Mm-hmm. And then it's just constantly identifying with all three. Yes. Okay. The moment you do that, then you bring grief to yourself. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I say grief is avoidable. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So let's move to the next point that I would like to bring uh, to you that how to healthily handle emotions because remember emotions are natural human function so when we know how to handle emotions even intense emotions when we are able to handle those emotions in the right way we are preventing ourselves from getting into grief okay so let's take a look into how do we handle uh, emotions and those of you who are familiar with the APG training in neurosemantics, the accessing personal genius. So one of the patterns in APG is this pattern called metastating troubling emotions. So when we have emotions, how do we metastate it healthily in order that the energy of that emotion is resolved healthily? Okay. So the first step in metastating uh, troubling emotion is to identify the emotional state which you have difficulties handling, controlling, or managing. Now, what are the states? The primary states of anger, sadness, guilt, fear. So these are some of the primary states that uh, most people have trouble with. Uh, It's just that some people also have trouble with the the state of happiness because, yep, I've been accused of being too happy because I uh, (laughs) tend to laugh at myself too much. So, (laughs) so, yeah, maybe some people have problems with uh, with, uh, happiness, so that's okay. (laughs) Now, for most people, they have difficulties in handling anger, sadness, guilt, fear. So when you experience a tragic uh, event, the first thing is to identify that emotional state. Now, when I say identify that emotional state, if the event is of high intensity tragic, and so tragic means high intensity, such as death, then most probably you will not experience only one of those emotions. You may feel sad, guilty, and angry at the same time. It's just that the first step is to identify what is that state. It's okay for you to feel uh, uh, any or even all of those emotions. Uh, 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 A death of someone close to you may trigger that sadness, guilt, and anger, and also fear. So all of those may come in. So the first step is to identify uh, the emotional state. So it can be any or all of those. Now, the second step. So this is not APG, so I will not be going in detail. Just to, tell, just to inform you that these are specific steps that we take. When we take these steps, then we are able to, uh, to uh, consume all of those energies that come from the uh, emotion. So the next step is to check your permission level because this part, uh, 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 this step is about you allowing yourself to feel the feeling. Now, what prevents some people from feeling that feeling is that they have prohibited themselves to feel in that particular way. So... That's why you need to check your permission level. Do you give yourself permission to feel sad? Do you feel, give yourself permission to feel angry? 
some people they prohibit it because of some social or uh, uh, historical events that cause them to prohibit things like big boys don't cry so you uh, some somebody that you love dies and you feel sad and because of that sadness you uh, you feel like crying and because of that no 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 i shouldn't and so so they prohibit themselves from feeling that okay so that's the second step okay? to feel the feeling and to give permission if you have not given yourself permission to do that uh, you want to give yourself permission to do that. Now, this step is, is I notice in a few of the cases that, uh, that I've come across with, this is the step that many people skip. And that is why they, uh, they flip-flop. They feel good and then they'll go back to where they were. Yeah? So this is the step that many uh, people skip. And when they skip this, the emotion of that, sorry, the energy of that emotion is still stuck in the body. So that's why uh, when they talk to themselves to feel better, they'll come back uh, to feeling angry or sad uh, because that uh, energy is still there. So this emotion, uh, this step is critical. Yeah, it's critical. Uh, I've... Uh, uh, come across uh, several cases whereby a person feels that uh, uh, it, it was already a few weeks after the uh, death of his partner, and then he says that he thought that he's uh, already over it, but then he keeps uh, going back to feeling sad, and sometimes he felt depressed about it, uh, and he thought that he's, uh, uh, he's uh, handled himself uh, pretty well. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when we went back to this part, Getting, uh, 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 getting that uh, that friend to feel what it felt when his partner, uh, his wife passed away, uh, and it didn't take long. It was only about for twenty minutes or so, allowing him to feel that fully and completely. Then the energy uh, completely dissipated, and he can move to the next step. So I just want to mention over here: many people skip this step. Yeah to give yourself permission to feel and to feel feel it. Now, another thing I just want to mention over here is that tragic events may induce shock. So that's why facilitating yourself uh, when you are facing tra tragic event and uh, uh, facilitating others when they uh, uh, to process their feelings is that immediately after the uh, the event occurring, some people may take a little bit of time for the to overcome that shock. Shock causes the uh, the emotions to be stored instead of uh, be there. So the person may not be aware that they feel uh, sad or angry because the shock causes them to to be numb. So if you meet people uh, post. Uh, uh, traumatic uh, experience and they say that they feel numb that's okay they are still in shock so just remember that when we talk about uh, checking the permission level somebody who's in shock may not feel at that time so to allow the person to get over that shock only then they'll be able to feel the feelings okay so this is the second step the third step is as Michael puts it, as to design engineer a metastating structure. Uh, I put over here as to expose the metastating structure. So you have an event there, and the event, let's say the event is death of a loved one, and you feel sad, really sad about what happened down there. So this is the time to fully expose the metastating uh, structure to identify the metastating structure of grief, and then to remove that structure before we can move to the next step. So what we do is to identify what are the thoughts, what are the meanings, what are the beliefs that you have about uh, what has happened. So in the context of the death of loved one, what are you thinking about that, uh, that death? 
And so what are, what are the meanings that you put about it and what are your beliefs? And you want to explore as much as possible. Now, what prevents you from fully exploring is that sometimes our, uh, uh, our intelligence trick us. <laughs> I, I use the word our intelligence because we have learned about thinking negatively and positively. So when we think ne uh, negatively and then we counter it with a positive thinking, I mean glass half full kind of thinking, then we, we think that, okay, that's done. I, I'm okay with that. So at this stage, let the, let the positive metastating rest for a moment. Just explore the full structure of the uh, unresourceful thinking. Explore them fully and completely. Why? Because after that, you want to delete all of those. Delete all of those meanings, beliefs, and thoughts. Remember, you are the meaning maker. You are the one who create the thoughts, mean, uh, meanings, and beliefs. And if those thoughts, meanings, and beliefs are causing you, uh, you to feel hurt or be harmed, then you can just delete them. How we delete them? Uh, those of you from APG, you know that we use the metano uh, 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 process because a no, a strong no, will turn those beliefs into mere thoughts and thoughts will just uh, uh, evaporate. Okay, so that's how you, when you expose the metastating structure, then you uh, destroy them, delete them. There are, there are uh, many different types of processes. The process that is uh, most uh, effective and efficient is using the no to all of those unresourceful beliefs and meanings. Then we move to the next step. The fourth step is to Meta state the negative emotion, the emotion, uh, the, the emotion of sadness or grief, to meta state that emotion with powerful mental emotional resolve. resolve. And uh, the, the, uh, the way to do it is to deliberately ask yourself the question, how differently or how resourcefully can I think about this event? So now you are going into deliberate thinking positively about that event. I remember when uh, my father passed away more than five years ago, uh, I allowed myself to be uh, to feel that sadness for two days. Don't ask me why two days. Somehow my mind say two days. So okay, I'm going to feel sad for two days. So after the two days uh, 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 passed, uh, I, I, asked my, uh, I asked myself, Okay, it's been two days, so uh, uh, have you had enough of sadness? Uh, I, I talk to myself. How many of you talk to yourself? <laughs> so I'm not the only crazy one here. <laughs> so I said to myself, so how long do you want to continue feeling sad? Another year? Another 10 years? I said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to feel sad anymore. My father wouldn't want uh, that. So, and then I asked myself, how differently do I want to think about my father's death? And then I answered by saying, oh, instead of thinking about him dying, I want to think about his legacy. What's the legacy that he left behind? What are the good things that he's brought into my life that I can bring into my future? So that is what I'm referring to, uh, creating a powerful mental, emotional resource. In that way, we are building a new metastating structure of thoughts, meanings, beliefs, values, creating another meta structure which is enhancing which is empowering yeah and then with that uh, uh, new enhancing structure we are going to next step is to quality control the permission and add needed reframes if you want so take all of those meanings and check are these uh, resourceful are these useful Will they help me? Uh, is it ecological with the people around me when I, uh, when I have these frames operating from these frames? 
Uh, will it be useful? Uh, will it, it bring uh, 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 me forward? So those are what we call the quality control. So once we have quality control that we reaffirmed all of those uh, meanings, beliefs. So reaffirm that, then you are setting that those as beliefs within you. The beliefs that are strong and empowering that will bring you forward. So that's step number five. And finally, step number six is to future pace and install. Future pace is basically mental imagine, uh, imagery about how you are going to perform in the future with these new frames. Yeah. So that's basically the six step process in metastating troubling emotions. Okay, now I went through the, those very quickly. However, the uh, effectiveness of this metastating troubling emotions. Uh, ah, so this is a, a summary. Uh, okay, let me just put in the summary. The first step is to identify the emotional state which you have difficulties handling uh, or controlling. Uh, yep. Next step is to check your permission level. The third step is to design engineer metastating structure. The fourth step is to quality control uh, the permission and add uh, needed, uh, sorry, the fifth step, sorry, uh, to quality control. And the sixth step is to future pace. Now, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, the effectiveness of running these metastating troubling emotions, uh, there is a prerequisite to it, prerequisite to it as uh, Michael uh, mentioned. Uh, you want to have the skills for empowerment in place. When you have the skills for empowerment in place, running the metastating troubling emotions uh, will be much easier. If you don't have the skills for empowerment in place, then uh, uh, I would highly suggest that you get somebody to uh, run that process uh, for you uh, because uh, without the skills for empowerment, you might, uh, mm -hmm. you might find gaps in the way that you are doing it. What are the skills for empowerment? One is about power. Ownership of your powers to, to be fully, uh, to be the full owner of your powers of thinking, feeling, saying and doing, your four central powers. So the first one is the ownership of your power zone, to be aware of your powers and to own your powers. Yeah? The second one is uh, self, to accept, appreciate and be in awe of self. So this gives you unconditional self-esteem. The third skill is the skill of be belief. This allows you to confirm and disconfirm belief. So when you throw away the unresolved frames that's causing the grief, it requires the power of disconfirmation of unresolved belief and the power of confirmation of uh, resourceful belief. And the fourth uh, uh, skill for empowerment is the skill of pleasuring. The skill of pleasuring uh, uh, things that are healthy for you and also the skill of de-pleasuring things that are unhealthy for you. So as I mentioned, these are the four uh, patterns that we use in APG. So that covers the first uh, theme that I mentioned to you that we are discussing this evening that is on the theme of uh, the neurosemantics of uh, the neurosemantics of managing grief. And what I mentioned earlier that emotions are a natural uh, process uh, of being human. However, grief is avoidable and unnecessary. When you have the skill to, uh, to manage your emotions healthily, then you, you can prevent yourself from falling into the trap of grief. So I'd like to open to uh, questions or comments or insights uh, that any one of you has, so go ahead. Um, 
I have a question just to check I understand. Um, when when asking the meta questions in, in this situation, with, with step one, that's where you would be asking what is your frame of reference of this? Do I understand? I'm sorry, I, did, I, I didn't get your question. So I'm just looking at from the perspective as a facilitator in this situation mm -hmm. where you would want to identify the emotional state. Mm -hmm. um, would that be where you ask, what is your frame of reference? Um, no, it's a simple question of how do you feel? Okay. What, what is it that you're feeling? Mm -hmm. And then step two would then be, have you given yourself permission? Mm -hmm. And then three would then also be, um, what did I write? What are your, yeah, you said it. It's what are your beliefs about this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, step, uh, step three would be asking the person, so what is it that, uh, so from the question of what is it that you feel? So the person is, I feel sad. I feel um, uh, angry. I feel guilty. So you just go three one by one. So let, let's take a look at this uh, uh, sadness. And step number two is to allow the person to feel. Because if the, if the person doesn't feel going to the next step, it's going to cause the person to, to loop. So after the person feels completely, and only then you can, uh, you can dissect that. So only then you can ask the question, so regarding this sadness, so what do you... Uh, what is it that you think about this sadness? And what does that mean to you? And then you begin to explore uh, all of those pieces. Make sense? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, Nitikun, go ahead. Um, this sounds a lot like uh, CBT or DBT that I had once heard of. Mm. Is it like, yeah, it's like um, a, a more clear mechanism of it <laughs> yeah uh, yeah we, we uh, in neurosemantics we call this as pattern so it's a step by step process that's why we call it the uh, meta stating meta stating is you are bringing in resourceful states onto an unresourceful state that's a meta stating so the unresourceful state here is the state of sadness, which may trap the person into grief. So what we are doing is that, okay, so let's let's meta state that sadness. So we bring in a more resourceful state. So what, what states are resourceful to, uh, to, to cover this sadness? So we bring in maybe calmness. We bring in uh, uh, patience. We bring in appreciation afterwards so so these are the states that we bring to uh, the word is to overcome that unresourcefulness yeah? and it's it, uh, and it's not just taking in positive states to put over it uh, if it is a high intensity unresourceful state we want to delete that first before we bring in the resourceful one. So step number three uh, is about to uh, delete the unresourceful state. So Christian, go ahead. Azuki, I just want to check with you. You said at question two, the permission, the client may feel shocked if there's a tragic event. Mm. Okay. So what do you do if your client is shocked? Do you add permission to the shock? Do you do a induction of a state of where they are through the shock? They have the resource, you just experience it, or like what? What would be the step then? Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, depending on uh, the word that I will use, the skill of the client. Uh, uh, people who are highly skilled, they can overcome that shock very quickly. People who are less skilled, uh, they will take time to overcome that shock. So later on, um, uh, I will be going into the structure of shock, how to ha uh, how to handle shock or reduce shock. Uh, so that, that is something that we'll be uh, 
looking in. Yeah. Okay. So Thank to, you. To, to facilitate the thinking process, um, to because shock to some extent is caused by the denial of what happened. Mm. Yeah. So now to bring them to the position whereby they can accept what happened, then uh, that will help them to overcome that shock. Then that's why you, you notice some people, they say that only after a few hours or a few days, then all the emotion starts to rush in. Yeah? So it means to say before that, they were in shock. Because part of the prime directive of our unconscious mind is that when uh, it detects, our unconscious mind detects that we are not emotionally uh, capable of handling a certain emotion, it automatically will suppress that emotion uh, in order that we continue to survive. Yeah. So that, that is why when a person uh, is able to overcome that shock, only then the emotions come in. The unconscious mind will present to us the emotions so that we can deal with those emotions. Uh, go ahead. May I know how you pro how do I pronounce your name? Uh, please. La Shay. La Shay. La Shay. Yes. Thank you. So go ahead, La Shay. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Mazuki, what about blocked emotions? So I'm not talking about shock. Let's say there's been a period of time that has passed. So one, maybe it's extended shock, but it's evident that there are blocked emotions. Yeah. So um, as meta coast meta coaches do meta coaches deal with that or is that something that gets referred now uh, any emotion that a person blocks it means to say that before they can feel that they need to give themselves permission to feel so that's why that uh, that uh, i think step number uh, i can't remember now two or three uh, uh, yeah, step number two, check permission level. So if uh, uh, the person is holding themselves back from feeling that, so it means to say that they have prohibited it, they have tabooed that, uh, that emotion, so they block it. So that is, that is why uh, when, uh, if you notice somebody doing that, you, uh, the, instead of asking the person to feel that, you ask the person, so what would it take for you to uh, give yourself? Oh, hold on. Yeah. What will it take for you to give yourself the permission to feel that? What's preventing you from allowing yourself? Yeah. And uh, for most people in that situation, that question alone will cause them to take a step back and they may not realize that they've not allowed that. My, uh, my wife, uh, Rosita, is here in this room uh, with us this evening. Um, when, uh, when I lost my uh, eldest sister, there, there are seven of us in the family. We have only one sister, the eldest, and the rest of them are brothers. Now, uh, she passed away due to... Uh, uh, what do you call it? hemorrhage, uh, eight months pregnant. Uh, 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 she hemorrhaged and she died with the baby. Uh, now, at the, at, at the time when she died, um, Rosita, my wife, was in hospital uh, as well, a different hospital, uh, what, 300 miles apart. So she was in hospital uh, due to complica uh, complications due to pregnancy as well. Uh, and then uh, at that particular time, my, my father felt totally helpless. So I had to take on the responsibility of organizing things, uh, organizing people, organizing relatives to go uh, for the funeral. So unconsciously, what I did was I blocked all emotions in order to, uh, to, uh, to handle all the uh, uh, arrangements for the funeral and all that. Uh, and I couldn't feel, uh, I could not just 
feel that sadness at that time. But later on, it came to the point whereby I find difficulty in feeling other feelings. Yeah. So it was a few years later that Rosita uh, asked me that uh, 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 to, to explore that, to give myself permission to feel. So a uh, few years later, when I did that, only then uh, you can say that I became human again. I told you, uh, do you want to say anything about that? <laughs> Yeah, you did. You you said it well. Don't really have to say much uh, except for that. Uh, because at that time, we were not uh, aware of just thing. And, uh, but I could feel that uh, he was not able to uh, express his emotion properly. And uh, fortunately, I have some understanding on that and learn about it. So that... Uh, that's why I was able to ask him to do something about it. It took a lot of influence as well <laughs> to get him to do it because someone who has a uh what, what is it that stuck stuck energy oh. yeah sometimes we do not realize uh that we we have that uh, then when we realize and we need to do something then we take the right step then hopefully it will be able to be unblocked. Uh, and, and anyone see this? This is the uh, the crest. We call it the college crest. I came from an all-boys school. Boys don't have emotions. <laughs> That's the background that I came from. Yeah. So, so these are things that uh, we taboo ourselves. And because of that, it hurts us. It harms us. So that, that's why I started off this session by saying that emotions are the natural human process. Yeah, it's just that uh, if we don't if we don't handle the self-reflexive process healthily, then we bring grief on ourselves. So that metastating uh, 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 unresourceful emotion pattern is about feeling those emotions healthily and being fully human rather than uh, cutting ourselves from our emotions, okay? So uh, allow me to move on to uh, uh, the next theme. Uh, it, or before I do that, is there any additional question that anybody would like to ask? Go, go ahead, uh, Caroline. Yes, thank you. Um, so, so let me see if I can get this succinctly. There, well, let me ask this question. So when do you define it as how, how in your view, when is it a healthy ex expression and a feeling of emotion? And when does it, when is it not healthy so that then you'd want to do a pattern like this, given that all emotions are normal, natural, um, but what's the distinction? Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, what is healthy is to feel that. What is unhealthy is when your thinking feeling starts to hurt you. So you are compounding it. It starts to hurt you. Or your saying doing starts to hurt you and others. That's unhealthy. So that's why uh, uh, what we are going to, uh, what I covered earlier, I mentioned about to feel it. So as I said to uh, uh, my cousin in this uh, particular situation, uh, I said to her, just be by yourself uh, with no one around. Just feel those feelings fully and completely. And in the next uh, uh, part, I'll be going into detail about how to do that when your thoughts are running away. It's, it, it, it's a riot uh, up there. How to feel healthily. There is a way that we can do that. <laughs> Thank goodness to people who are uh, who have discovered all of this. I'm just the messenger here. It doesn't come from me. <laughs> Does that uh, help uh, help you, Caroline? Yeah. Yes, and I think the the next part will as well because what? How do we define what's hurting us and what is? Yeah, that if because if we have a taboo that feeling sad doesn't feel great, mm -hmm. then we might say, "Well, I'm hurting myself by feeling sad." Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Actually, it's just normal and natural and part of the process to move through something we've lost. So, yeah. so yeah, so I'm curious to hear more about how we know when it's actually hurting us and when it just feels uncomfortable or not great. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So I go to Eva. Eva, go ahead. Yeah, uh, coming back to the state of shock, can shock be something like a soldier having like shell shock, like when they get flashbacks of war? Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's a very, uh, I'll use the word intense example of shock. Uh, that's why in, in uh, the military, they call it shell shock. Uh, the shock that is caused by the, uh, by the, ugliness of war, uh, a person can uh, can just, uh, the, the, the emotions are just there bubbling under the surface to the extent that uh, it, it is this difficult for them to operate uh, as a uh, fully functioning fully functioning human beings because they have to hold all of those uh, fear, uh, 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 anger inside of them and it eats them. These are dragon states. We call them dragon states because these states are just hurting themselves more. Yeah. yeah. So for shock, the first thing is to bring the person to a safe space to allow them to begin to feel. Okay. So let's move to the next uh, uh, theme uh, for this evening, uh, which is on what to do during uh, tragic events. Now, I've covered, uh, uh, listed here, uh, what, five points that I would just like to mention. One is, the first one is, uh, manage your own emotions. So you are the meaning maker. You are the one who's creating the meanings that's causing you to feel those. So when you experience a tragic event, you want to manage your emotions, meaning to say, run this metastating troubling emotions. Yeah. If you already know how to feel and allow yourself to uh, uh, how allow that that uh, the emotion to just the energy of the emotion to just flow, you may not even need to uh, use the metastating troubling emotion because you are experiencing an emotion and that emotion is not troubling you. So that's why this pattern is called metastating troubling emotion. If you have come to the point whereby you are able to healthily experience sadness, anger, guilt, fear, you can healthily experience those emotions you don't need to metastate it uh, in the way that I've just mentioned because you are already at the level whereby you are able to uh, feel and allow those uh, emotions to uh, go through you. Now, if you come across people who do not have those skills and if you don't have that skill, seek help, get help because your health is very important. If you don't have enough skill to run your emotions healthily, get somebody to help you. Okay, so that's the first one. And in the, in the scenario where I mentioned about, uh, about my cousin passing away, uh, I, uh, to a certain extent, I'm uh, grateful that my uh, two cousins, uh, they, they were facing difficulty and they quickly contacted me and asked me for help. And, I, I, and I'm glad that I was able to help them. And I'm still helping them to go through this. So the first one is to manage your own emotion. All emotions are equal. <clears throat> to the, the key thing about emotion is acceptance. To accept that, hey, I feel sad. To accept that I feel uh, angry. Uh, to accept that I feel uh, guilty. That is the first part of doing that. So manage your own emotions. So that's the first one. And uh, just as anecdote, uh, what happened was, uh, this is uh, for me, I'm practicing to allow myself to feel. Uh, a few months ago, there was uh, a road accident uh, right in front of my house. 
uh, and uh, I think the boy is 15 or 16 year old boy. Uh, he died on the spot. So as I came back from my morning uh, run, I went to a vantage point. I looked at the, uh, uh, at the lifeless body on the road. And I just stood there, there, allowing myself for a few minutes to look at the, uh, 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 the body on the road and to allow that, because that's a loss of life, and to allow that feeling of sadness to come in uh, and allowing myself to feel the sadness of the loss of life. So I just was there by myself feeling sad for what, five, ten minutes and allowing the tears to come down and then moving on to the next step. So this is, uh, so I did that in order for, to allow myself to feel instead of uh, to create barriers about feeling of emotions. Okay, so that, that's the first uh, point that I want to mention. Manage your own emotions if tragic events occur. Now, this next one, what to do when you, em, your emotions run riot? Okay? We experience the emotions of anger, sadness, guilt, fear. And what if they start a riot inside there? <laughs> now, this rioting is caused by uncontrollable framing and reframing in our mind. The self-reflexive process, we think in this way and we think in that way, we think in this way, in that way, and that just uh, triggers all of those emotions in one go. We feel sad that the person has uh, passed away. We feel guilty that we have not done enough uh, when they were alive, uh, and we feel angry that they have uh, uh, left us uh, uh, without any support. Uh, we feel fearful that since they, they, are, uh, they are gone, uh, we may not be able to do certain things in our life. So yes, all of those uh, can come in and can create that writing. And uh, for many people, one of the reasons why they disallow themselves to feel is because they are fearful that their, their feelings, their emotions will overcome them and they cannot control themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about it is that for many people, when they, uh, uh, when they experience this situation, they back off. The key thing is not to back off. The key thing is when you feel that your emotions are writing, running away with you, you go in and feel that fully and completely. That's how you overcome strong emotions. You don't overcome, you are fighting them. You are allowing the emotions to just flow. Emotions are energy, emotional energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It just changes form. So when you go in and feel those energy, it will transform. It might transform into, say, heat energy. So that's why people who are going through emo uh, emotional uh, stress. Uh, I, I, I took a deep breath just now because, uh, because when, uh, when I visited uh, my uh, cousin when he was still in hospital uh, and uh, uh, his younger sister was there and uh, she was uh, uh, upset and she was uh, perspiring all over. So that's how the emotion is running in her body causing her to perspire. So when you allow the emotions to run through the body, it could come out in the form of heat energy, it can come out through tears. So that's part of how the emotion goes out of your body. So how to prevent that riot? Uh, I remember uh, uh, someone mentioned that our mind can uh, uh, runs two uh, processes um, and it can only run one process at a time. One is the internal process, the other is the external process. So when it is writing, our internal process is in overdrive. Our thinking, feeling, meaning making, uh, believing, uh, all of those are running uh, uh, over time. So how to overcome that is to go into uh, the feel. The moment you go into the body, you are activating the 
uh, the other uh, process, the process in the body instead of the process in the mind. So what you do is that you focus on the kinesthetics of the emotion. So those of you who are familiar with NLP, we call this sub-modalities. Those of you who are familiar, more familiar with neurosemantics, we call them meta-modalities. Now, when, let's say you feel that sadness, you go into noticing where is that sadness in my body? Is it all over my body or is it in certain part? Is there a shape to it? Is there a, some a, a feel of pressure to it? Is there a... Uh, 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 is there a texture to it? Is it hot or cold? So you just go in and feel that fully, completely in all its modalities. Because the moment you do that, you are bringing your focus to your physiology. The moment you bring your focus to your physiology, that, that uh, self-reflexive process just freezes. It stops. So this is the key to getting... Uh, yourself to um, to stop all of that uh, writing of emotions in inside of you. And the thing about it is this: the moment you start to notice the kinesthetics of your emotion, you are in fact already meta stating. So that's why in neurosemantics we call them meta modalities instead of sub modalities. Because in order for you to notice all of the sensations, you need to take a step back out of your body to notice. Oh, it's uh, it's around my chest. It's uh, rounded, but it's slightly rough. So the moment you begin to notice that, you are taking almost a third-party observer position, and that allows the emotion to just flow out. So this is what you do when when... Uh, your emotions begin to run. Okay, so that's the second point that I want to bring. What to do during tragic events? The third point that I want to bring is help others with their emotion, allowing others to feel, and don't try to reframe other people's emotions. There are many different ways, and if you notice that many different ways that culture, society has taught us to reframe our, uh, other people's uh, emotions, right? One of the things that, uh, uh, that uh, I've come across is that people begin to taboo uh, certain emotions. Oh, you don't need to feel too sad. Uh, that's okay. Uh, it, 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 um, let's say the person has been... Um, uh, has been ill for quite some time. He's been ill for uh, for so long, so no need to, for him to feel sad because now he is not in pain anymore. So that you are reframing people reframe in different ways. Uh, sometimes uh, these are common things that I hear people say uh, to people who are uh, sad or grieving, uh, saying to the person that oh he or she is now in a better place. Uh, or uh, maybe you've heard people say, oh, God loves him more. Uh, that's why he's taken him away from us in order for him to be uh, in the mercy of God. So those are all reframes. And those reframes are someone else's reframe, not the person's reframe. So that's why when you want to help others with their emotions, all that you want, all that you just need to do is to just be there and affirm to that person, it's okay for you to feel what you are feeling right now because it just proves that you are human. And the danger of reframing too early is that if the person has not gone through the feeling process, reframing too early will cause the person to come back. So there will be that flip-flop. They'll feel good at, uh, because of the reframe, and then they'll come back uh, here again, uh, feel down. And, and that will be a, a downward spiral that that person might, uh, might go through. Yeah? Tragic events may induce shock. And some people, depending on the skill, may need time to process the feelings. So when you are with people who have experienced tragic events, how you help uh, them with the emotions 
is just to be there to allow them to feel whatever that they feel. Or even if uh, they don't feel because they are shocked, to say to them, it's okay that you are uh, that you don't feel right now because you may be in shock. Just to validate whatever emotional experience that they are going through. Yeah. Another thing that I just want to mention over here is that when we attend functions of tragic events, you know, like uh, somebody passed away and there is that funeral. So we attend that function, uh, 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 that funeral. So when we attend functions of tragic events, the only thing that I just want to mention over here is that be clear what you are there for, to have that clarity of roles, to also know the priorities. I typically use this as my uh, guide when I attend uh, functions uh, of tragic events. This, I, I call it, I, I can't find a name for it, so I call it the concentric circle of relationships. Uh, don't look for it in Google, probably that's not the right term that they use. But what I'm referring to is that uh, for each uh, and every one of us, we have this first uh, circle of immediate family. Then we have the extended family. Then we have friends, colleagues out there, and then the other strangers out there. I, I call this the concentric circle of relationships because the smaller circle are, are the people who are close to the person involved. Now, when it comes to uh, attending functions, what we need to realize is that the support comes from outside in. So if let's say I'm from the extended family, when I attend function of tragic event, I'm focused on giving attention and support to the immediate family because they are the ones who need most. So instead of going to function in getting people to support me. <laughs> I need to handle my stuff first. My focus is on to support the people who are closest to uh, uh, the person involved. Yeah. So and this is where uh, I consider uh, that I feel grateful about learning neurosemantics, about uh, uh, learning about meta coaching, it gives me the clarity about when attending such functions, what am I there for? So uh, in this situation where I mentioned to you, my cousin passed away. Uh, so when I attend that function, my focus is that there are the, uh, there's my uncle, there are my three uh, cousins uh, there, then my cousin's uh, wife, and his daughter. So when I go to that function, my focus is what is it that I can do to help these people, to focus on uh, the service that I can give them. Yeah. And finally, one last point that I uh, bring over here, uh, it, it came up to me because uh, in this, situ in this uh, most current situation, uh, when my uh, cousin passed away, his two uh, younger sisters, uh, came to me and said, can you help me to break the bad news to our father, my uncle? Because they feel that they were not uh, they, they were not in the right state in order to uh, break the news to, uh, to their father. So I, uh, they asked me to do that. So when you are the bearer of bad news, the first thing is to realize that how to reduce the shock. Because when we receive bad news, uh, the shock is we have our expectation of things. So uh, in this situation, he may have the expectation that his son might recover. Now the reality is that his son has passed away. So how to reduce that shock? We need to give him the right information, but to prevent that shock. So the first thing is, as we know, uh, in neurosemantics, we communicate from state to state. So the first thing is yes. to access the resourceful states. For me, I, uh, I believe that the most resourceful states for uh, delivering bad news, one is the state of compassion. Then the state of calmness and the state of patience. So from 
this states only then I deliver the news. And the key thing when delivering bad news is do it slowly, gently, and lovingly. So by doing that, you are reducing the impact of the uh, news. You are reducing the force that the news comes to that, uh, to that person. Uh, I need to. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, I I like to request uh, uh, if anyone's uh, mic is on, I like to request it to be uh, muted. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'd like to <laughs> give you a warning over here, a little bit of a geek alert warning uh, when I. When I mentioned to how to do it uh, slowly, gently, and lovingly, uh, I started to think about it. I call it the structure of surprise or shock, because I begin to think: how do we how how do we reduce uh, shock? What is shock in a person? So it comes because of a certain uh, force, isn't it? Yeah, shock is a force. So I say to you, geek alert. Uh, let me just uh, check because I'm I'm hearing quite a lot of uh, sounds in the background, but I can't find where that sound is. Okay. Now, uh, the greater the force, the greater the shock, isn't it? Yeah. So I begin to think about what I learned in my physics class. When I talk about force, any one of you remember? <laughs> That's uh, Newton's law of motion. F equals ma. Force equals to mass times by acceleration. And the geek inside of me starts to kick in. So what is acceleration? Acceleration is final velocity minus initial velocity divided by time. So force is actually mass times by final velocity minus initial velocity divided by time. So the geek inside me went into saying mv2 minus mv1 divided by time. And mass times velocity is Momentum. So <laughs> this is the geek coming in. I came out with that formula. Force equals momentum one minus momentum two divided by time. And I see, oh, there is a parallel over here. Force, surprise or shock. Surprise is when the the uh, the, the reality is better than expectation. Shock is when reality is worse than expectation. So I look at this formula. S is either surprise or shock. EA is the actual uh, experience and E sub E is the expected experience. So if the... Uh, if the actual experience is less than the expected experience, then you experience shock, don't you? So when I look at this, I realize that how do I reduce this? I can increase this. So that's why when you deliver the information slowly, give it time then what happens that you start to reduce the shock and it works another way as well because when you give time it allows the person to re-evaluate their expected experience so they diminish that and because they diminish that as well then this goes down 
further. So this is the geek inside of me <laughs> that look into, okay, so that's how we reduce the shock in a person. We increase the time of delivery of the information. And by reducing the time, we reduce the intensity of the shock. And also we reduce the experience expectation gap in the person. I hope that uh, uh, make, uh, makes sense to you. Uh, probably it makes sense only to the geeks uh, around us. However, I hope that is uh, useful to you in that manner. So uh, that's it about the second part. So I'd like to open up for questions or comments uh, that anyone uh, has, because in the second, uh, in the second uh, theme, I talk about how to manage your own emotions what to do when your emotions run riot, help others with their emotions, uh, attending functions of tragic events, and when you are the bearer of bad news, how do you do that uh, in a more compassionate way? Okay, so I'd like to open for questions or comments from uh, any one of you. Yes, go ahead, Pierre. Um, yeah, the bearer of bad news, I really enjoy that because sometimes we rush ourselves to give the bad news. We're like, let's just get it over and done with. And it's actually the opposite of what you want to do is yeah. take the time, be patient, give them the news, allow them to process it, allow them to feel it. Yeah, that was really, that was, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Thank you. That, that is why when you want to surprise somebody, you want it to come like that, right? So that's so the structure of surprise and shock is the same. The moment you reduce the time, you increase the intensity. So you increase the time, you'll reduce the intensity. I remember once uh, we were we were having a, um, a company retreat, uh, and the, when I talk about company, we, we are a small company. That's my wife and my daughter who works in the company. So when we went for a retreat, it is like a family holiday yeah? and it so happened that retreat for that year uh, one of the days was my birthday so uh, my wife and daughter prepared uh, a surprise for us uh, for me so she's uh, my wife sent me to the shop to buy something so uh, I'm the kind who doesn't even remember my birthday <laughs> I, I didn't really bother so I went to the shop to buy uh, the thing and they were discussing the surprise that they had what they failed to notice, there was one person uh, in the group. Uh, I think she's about, it's my uh, eldest granddaughter. At, this, at that time, she was about three years old. So she was so excited, uh, uh, the surprise that has been prepared for grandfather. Everybody forgot about her. So that when I came back and opened the door, she excitedly came to me, Grandfather, we have a surprise for you. <laughs> so I was given advance warning. And because of that, I had to fake my surprise for the benefit of my granddaughter. <laughs> so the structure of shock and surprise is uh, the same. So lengthen the time. Do it slowly. That will help the person. Yeah. So, everyone good with that? Yeah. So, yes, Eva. Go ahead, Eva. Yeah, you were saying that when we feel an emotion, we should feel it completely. How about when we feel anger? If we feel too much of it, will we do something like stupid, like uh, be physical, scream or hit someone? Or if the kinesthetic feeling of anger is to hit something? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Eva. So we go back to the four central powers. Power of thinking, power of feeling, power of saying, power of doing. When I say feel your emotions, you just use one of those powers. That is the power of feeling. Then the anger will subside. 
if you also use your power of thinking, you are going to spiral it uh, out of control. If you use your power of saying, you shout, you swear, you scream, uh, you use your power of doing, you punch things, you are going to escalate that energy. So when I say feel your feelings, just utilize that one power, that one power of feeling. Go in, feel. Is it warm? Is it cold? Where is it? Is it on my neck? Is it on my chest? Just do that. Is that helpful, Eva? Yeah. Thank you. Because if you engage the other three powers, you're going to escalate it. Mm -hmm. Yes, Adeline, go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, I find this a, a, a great session. Thank you for this. I wanted to ask if a person went through such tremendous loss that they were not able to cope with it, so they are in a cycle of uh, denial. Um, is there certain techniques that would help them to... So now they are in this unhealthy state. Mm. And... Um, just uh, emphasizing for, for those persons who are in tremendous denial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when a person is uh, in denial, so I'm just... Uh, that is not the place where they can heal. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to draw, uh, write this from bottom up, uh, because uh, I, I don't know how to uh, do this. Let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, I'll just go to my. Uh, yeah, let me just. Uh, if, yep, I'll just add a slide over here. And I'll just share this screen. Whoops, wrong one. I'll just share a different one. Okay. So uh, the, the key thing over here is that when now I've not done this, let me do this uh, as best as I can. Uh, oh. There you go. Okay. When a person is in denial, I'll just change that so that you can see better. Okay. When a person is in denial or uh, they are laying blame, or they are justifying. The lowest level here is quit. That's the lowest level. So when a person is operating uh, in, uh, in, in these ways, change will not occur. They will remain as where they are. The key is to move beyond the line. This line is the line of response. I'll, I'll spell it in a way that I mean it over here. But they need to move to this line. Okay, so I'll just uh, increase that so that you can see better. Okay, can you see that? Okay, so. Yeah. When, when a person is operating anywhere down here, below, that, below this line, 
justifying lay blame denial quit this are uh, uh, from the perspective of coaching we say that this person is not yet coachable and if a person is not yet coachable this person will find great difficulty in affecting change change will only occur when you go above the line and take responsibility when we talk about responsibility that now you are responsible for your thinking your feeling your saying doing and knowing the boundary of your powers to not go beyond the boundary of your powers meaning to say i am the full owner of my powers of thinking feeling saying doing i am i am i don't own or i uh, i am not uh, responsible so the word responsibility i am not responsible for your thinking feeling your saying and doing so to be clear about that line of responsibility so uh, when, when a person is uh, still operating from below the line uh, uh, this are what we we need to do is to the remedial is to bring the person to to first accept because when a person is justifying lay blame denial quit they are not accepting the reality and the reality of they are in control of certain parts of their lives and to uh, to not lay blame or justify others uh, for uh, their condition in life yeah so that's basically how i uh, how i uh, will address that is that thank useful you. eva yeah thanks marsuki thank you uh, go ahead uh, Nitikon? Yes, um, it's about uh, helping others with their emotions. Actually, I would like to ask is like, um, especially when it comes to what is preventing the person to have the permission to feel the emotion. So what if um, I wanted to help that individual mm. and somehow I am part of the reason that uh, the person is not giving himself the permission to feel. Mm. So um, how, how do I actually approach this individual? Mm. For example, just, just a very realistic uh, example is like, um, um, maybe I'm trying to help my father who mm -hmm. is facing some, some, some issues, mm -hmm. but in the same way, he is trying to... Um, um, show his masculinity, the taboo thing. Mm -hmm. So, like, um, he will never show his emotion to the son, for example. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, over here, uh, what I would say is that uh, it is not. Uh, I'm, I'm answering this from the uh, perspective of a coach. As a coach, I don't coach uh, anybody and everybody. I only coach people who wants to be coached. Yeah. So in the context of uh, a loved one, like your father, if he is not ready to be coached, don't. The only thing that you can do is be the son that loves the father. That's all. To learn how to love him unconditionally in the context that you do kind things to him, say kind things without expecting anything in return. Does that make sense? Yes, that totally makes sense. It's just that humans are so, I'll use the word, strange, that when you don't try to change them, that's when they want to change. True. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad. Okay, so um, we've come to the end of the session. I uh, uh, we've gone uh, almost 
10 minutes after the time and what I would like to do before we end uh, because the, the best bit whenever I have this this session is to get to know from you what is it that you, your your takeaway from the session if you don't mind uh, uh, in the next uh, few minutes just to share me, with me what is your uh, takeaway from this session maybe one or two things uh, 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 that that you can uh, that we can uh, that you can share with me. I, I'd like to start start at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Nor Hayati, uh, if you don't mind sharing with us, what is uh, one important thing, one main thing that you would take away from this session? If you are able to access your mic. No, that's okay. I, well, I start. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. In, uh, Ines, you want to go? Yes. <laughs> um, Mazuki, when you said that, um, that came uh, an example of uh, a person, uh, uh, um, sorry about my English, okay? I have some, I need some time to think before I speak. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> when it's about rage, uh, the person is <clears throat> angry and then uh, the person can punch, for example, and then you just ask the person to feel and not to behave. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like uh, this distinction because I didn't have this clear uh so this is one takeaway i when i speak to someone or to a coachee i can express this in a better way uh mm -hmm. so the person won't do something not to um um i don't know the word not acceptable for the moment for example <laughs> and um um this last thing that you said that when we don't want, when we quit to change someone, then this is the moment the person will start changing. So thank you. <laughs> I have problems with my mom too. And I always think that she could change it to be happier, but I, I can't do this for her. So first step is to accept. Thank you. <laughs> thank you uh, for that. Uh, I'll ask uh, Libu Seng if you like to say anything uh, before we end. Share with us your uh, takeaway. No? Okay, thank you. Now, moving on to Eva. Eva, uh, what's your takeaway for this evening? Uh, for me, it's Megas. Better stating the negative emotion mm. with a powerful mental emotional resource, like how differently can I think of this event okay. to, to get me out of that, that loophole. Okay. Right. Thank you, uh, Eva. Uh, Christian, you're next. Okay, so Wazuka, I have a few. <laughs> um, but for me, it was definitely the distinction because of the shock. Um, that's something I've never heard before. So I thank you for that. That is definitely uh, a big, uh, like in the neo-semantic side, the, the what if. So mm. it's, it's like, if this happens, the shock as the distinction I have now. Two, it's giving the bearer of bad news. Mm. Uh, I've been in such a situation the last two days and just as a supporting party. But even then it was like, okay, so how do you, that question does come up. How do you, be, be the bearer of bad news. So the shock and time formula really resonated and also being calm, patient and <laughs> compassionate. And then um, I'm giving my first APG, my second day this weekend and I'm doing doubling meta studying emotions. So hearing you do it, say it again is like, yes, <laughs> so I can follow again. So thank you for that. And the last but not least, the level of... Um, not acceptance, uh, permission. Mm -hmm. um, I read that and I was like, oh yes, the level, this is where you would want it to be um, almost like black or white. You want it to be a hundred percent yes. Like this 
uh, this level of um, permission shouldn't be, I give myself permission, but I only feel like six, seven, maybe you want it to be like, I feel this at 10 out of 10. And then as you explained with the internal, external, okay, so how do, then I asked myself, how would I know if it's a 10? I was like, okay, so ask if there's more and or check yeah. if the sub modality you could add more to it. Well, for us, the meta modality could, mm -hmm. is a texture to it and stuff. Yeah. So there's a lot of, a lot of awarenesses for me, but thank you. Thank you, uh, Christian, appreciate that. And uh, next, uh, Perth Palm. Oh, uh, lost it already. So last but not least, uh, Niti Kun, go ahead. What's your takeaway for today? Um, my greatest takeaway is ultimately um, the most direct and easiest person to work on is actually myself. Did I add anything that I wanted? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So with that, everyone, I uh, really appreciate uh, you all being here. Uh, it's an honor for me to be meeting uh, you this evening. And I hope that with the takeaway that uh, you have taken away with you, uh, it will enrich your life. So with that, I say uh, good night, God bless, uh, and may we meet again uh, at, in another uh, event. So with that, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Masuki. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Masuki.